So with that tonight, we have uh, Bo Vrola, his uh, brand new dinghy, Mayan. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, when he's done, stick around, and we're going to talk about the predicted log race, which is a very exciting thing. <laughs> oh. Thanks, Joe. Uh, can you guys hear me? Should I talk with or without the mic? Uh, with. with. Okay, with, with the mic. All right. Okay. Um, you'll notice our title at the bottom of the slide. Um, for those of you who haven't had the pleasure of owning an old wooden boat, and this one's 68 years old, um, you're not, you don't own it, it owns you. You're the caretaker. Um, and so my wonderful wife, Stacy, has agreed to, to do this. Um, my addiction to these kinds of boats started when I was 16, and I got hired as a deckhand on an 80-foot Alden schooner. She was 80 feet on deck. She was about 110 feet overall, a calf, four in Maine. And I got to go up to the cross trees and put the topsail up. And for a 16-year-old guy, there is nothing better than putting a topsail up in 25 knots of wind on, on just straddling the gaff and trying not to get blown off. Uh, I've never forgotten it. For my whole life, I have tried to return to those days when I got paid almost nothing. Now I get to pay for the privilege um, of, of basically driving one of John Alden's designs around. So we started looking, and we looked at a lot of boats. In fact, we looked at this one, Dauntless. Dauntless is I think we probably looked at 14, maybe 18 different schooners and uh, settled on this one. This is why. You know, why do you buy a cruising boat? You all know what our last boat looked like. It was a long, slender, like, pencil of a thing that healed over until about 25. Got everybody soaking wet and was gorgeous but highly impractical. So that's the crew. Um, you can see there's one little munchkin on the, on the right there. When she showed up, all of a sudden, all the moms in the group started to get pretty concerned about the fact that the boat was going to be healed 25 to 35 degrees and there were no lifelines. So we had to find a kind of boat where you can take your drink, and when it's time to tack, you put your drink down on the seat of the cockpit, you tack the boat, you pick your drink up, and it has not spilled. So that's what we were looking for. So we found Mayan, and it's, it's a bit of a shaggy dog about how we found her, but here's her history. In 1940. I got out of the Navy with, he had been stationed in Anchorage, not Anchorage, in the Aleutian Islands. And he had not been able to spend any of his pay for four and a half years. So he had that money and he had some money from his old man. And he convinced his dad, you, you all know we've done this, we want to convince your dad about some great scheme about what you're, how you're going to get rich quick or you're going to do this or do that. He talked his, his poor, long-suffering father into helping him fund the, the building of this boat. The reason that she was built in Belize is that she, originally she was built out of nothing but mahogany, white oak, and a, a, a word I can't pronounce right, but something along, it's not sapili, but it's sort of like that, which is a, like an ironwood. Um, I actually found the grandson of the guy who built her, um, of Stacy, the guy who built her, and uh, he's about 68, and he remembers her being built. So there she is going down the ways in 1947. She was the largest sailboat that this boatyard in Belize ever built, and the, the only one designed by what they considered a proper yacht designer. She's a John Olden. She's design number 356. It's easy to remember because there was a Porsche that was fairly famous with the same number. And the boat was originally designed in 1928, and they built one in 1928, which unfortunately went on a reef on, on Hatteras. Um, but uh, she was the second one built to that design. Here you can see her, them putting the deck on her. Um, one of the advantages of Belize is it's a tropical rainforest, at least in those days. And it had tons of mahogany, tons of teak, all kinds of great woods. So here she is with her rigs in her and her covers up. Um, she's about ready to make the passage to New York. As they sailed across on their way to New York, you'll notice here she's got a gaff on her foremast. Um, this was John Alden's favorite design of the period because he believed, and some would argue correctly, that you could get a lot of power out of the foresail because you had a, a big percentage of your sail area up in, in between. And um, John Alden actually took one of his designs and 45 years after the boat was built, he sailed it in the Bermuda race and won it just to kind of prove a point for the gaff-headed design, and that was in the 50s. Um, but at any rate, in 48, she took off, 
And here she is somewhere, we don't know where. We found these pictures in uh, Stacy's grandson's shoebox. Um, she's somewhere on the way to New York. Um, there's the young man who provided us with the pictures on the right. In this picture, he's 13 years old. Um, he still talks about this trip as the most important thing he ever did in his life, was to sail that boat across the Gulf of Mexico, around Florida, and up all the way up on the outside. They didn't go through the, um, the inland waterway, the intercoastal. Um, what's interesting is she's actually designed to do the intercoastal. She's, she has an air draft of 60 feet. She's four and a half feet deep, and she's 16 feet wide. And she's got a big centerboard, so you pull the centerboard up. Um, and when Alden designed her, she, he specifically designed her to be a snowbird and go up and down the intercoastal every, every spring and fall. But that's not the way they decided to go home. Sadly, the dinghy you see there is long gone. Um, she, she didn't have either the davits or the dinghy when we found her. But uh, the rest of her is pretty much the same. So here's sailing into New York Harbor, 1948. They put her on the market. And I think the next slide, well, actually, this is a little bit about the design. Um, so you can see in the center of the upper drawing a diagonal line coming down. That's the centerboard. So it disappears up into a bulkhead inside the boat, so you don't notice that it's there. Um, but with the board down, she draws nine feet. And she actually, we've only had a chance to sail her once against other schooners. And we got to sail against a great Sterling, Starling Burgess design, the Rosa Sharon. And she was actually more weatherly than Rosa Sharon. But that's because um, <laughs> the the Chamberlain likes to lay the boat over. And as you all know, with a long keel boat, once you get it over to about 45 degrees, there's not any keel left in the water, and it just kind of goes to leeward at fairly high <laughs> speeds. So I think most of the reason we were more weatherly is we were standing upright. Uh, but that's a very one of the difficulties, of course, with a centerboard boat. And the reason he designed her to be this shallow is to go to the, the uh, Kirks and Take Kirks and Takos, Turks and Caicos, and Bermuda, Bahamas, you know, places that are shallow. Um, but the rudder has got to be funny looking if you're gonna if you're gonna design a four and a half foot deep boat. Um, and she does develop some significant helm if you're not careful with that shaped rudder. So this is what the hull looks like. Um, the water line is the line that goes off the ends of the page there, left and right. And of course, the way these designs are always done, on the right side, you see the shape of the bow, and on the left side, you see the shape of the stern. When you drive this boat around with the centerboard up, it drags, it drives exactly like onward. It, it drives just like a Grand Banks. And so it's a single screw, um, big barn of a rudder, and it, you drive it just like a power boat when the centerboard's up. And uh, she also rolls like a sun beam C with the centerboard up. And the cure to that is put the centerboard down and put the four staysail up, because that'll stop the rolling. Here's her original rig. And actually, this design, this is a drawing that Alden did for the guys who built the boat, the Allen family. And you can see the, the bowsprit and boomkin. Her current rig is a staysail schooner. So the, the, the main staysail runs from the, the step, well, the, from the deck on the foremast up to that little jumper spreader on the main mast. The jumper spreader is not there any longer, um, and neither is the gaff. Um, and then the rest of the fort of the, of the center trapezoidal shape is filled with various staysails. And so you'll see in some pictures we have later, um, if it's blowing real hard, you don't want any of those upper staysails, which are technically called main topmast staysails. Um, but they're also called fishermen's and golly wobblers and all sorts of other colorful names. And then the other thing that happened, which is a wonderful story, uh, her previous owner is a musician called David Crosby. He sailed her around to San Diego with a bunch of his friends. Um, and they were tied up to the customs dock in San Diego going through customs. And at the dock, an eight meter got out of control, rammed them, and broke the bowsprit off. And David went kind of apoplectic over this because he had managed to stay straight and sober long enough to get through customs, and somebody wrecked his boat, so he <laughs> sort of lost it. Um, so the one difference in her rig, besides the staysail schooner, is David had never liked how much weather helm she had, so he made the bowsprit two and a half feet longer, just arbitrarily for no good reason other than he didn't like weather helm. Uh, 
Um, having sailed with David, I now know that the reason he has so much weather helm is he doesn't let the damn main sheet out. If he let the main sheet out, he wouldn't have the problem. <laughs> so in 1949, they put her on the market and they sold her in the first year. And this is a brochure they made up, which the Stacy family was nice enough to give us. And this is the guy they sold her to. He had been tossed out of the birds, which is a rock band some of you will remember. There are enough gray hairs in the room to remember this guy. But David got in an argument with Roger, got thrown out of the birds. He uh, had about half the money it took to He fell in love with her in Florida, and he called his buddy, who was the lead guitarist in the Monkees, and he borrowed another 6000 bucks from him, and he managed to buy the boat. At that point, I think he had almost no money. Um, and so if you look through his history, and his history is flying with this boat deeply, we know a lot about, this is 1960 when he bought the boat. We know a lot about what happened to the boat from 69 forward because David's still around and he's nice enough to tell us what he did with the boat and what's happened to her. Between 49 and 69, we have a list from the Coast Guard of who the owners were, but I've only been able to track down about two or three of them. Um, so she, she started into probably one of either the most pleasurable or terrible jobs that any sailing boat ever has to do, which is to be a party boat for a rock star. <laughs> well, she had a, you know, she, by 88, um, she'd been bobbing around in the Caribbean most of the time, or the Gulf of Mexico, and uh, she was naturally a mahogany on white oak boat. So it was time to rebuild her. And one of the things you learn about these old wooden boats is the boats were not built to last forever. If, if any of the guys who built this boat had ever ever been told that 68 years later we'd be sitting here talking about her, they would have laughed hysterically. She was iron fastened, and the reason she was iron fastened is because she was only going to last 15 years, and the iron fastenings with galvanized works just great for 15 years. It doesn't work so great for the next 15, and it really doesn't work for the 15 after that. And so the also, it, any of you, and there, I know there's some really good boats, so I, I'm, I might not get this exactly right, but the, the acid in white oak, which is what all her frames were, tends to eat its way through the galvanize. It reacts with the galvanize. And so it, it actually accelerates the process. So in Florida, they, they, they replanked the top part of the boat in, in, while she was in the water. Now, the interesting thing to note about wooden boats is they almost always rot because the fresh water leaks through the deck and not because of anything below the water line. The part that's soaked in salt water usually lasts almost forever. And in fact, Mayan still has her original keel, her horn timber, her stem, all of the lower bits, they're all just fine. There's nothing wrong with them because they're pickled in salt water. But, you know, the plank decks leak and as a result, fresh water runs down the inside of the planking and inside of the frames and that causes them to rot. So David, uh, had a little work done. Now, something cut into David's cruising career. Um, and, and this is a guy that Stacy and I have had the incredible pleasure of getting to know. Um, actually, why don't I make it here? We actually, David and I shook hands on the purchase price of this boat, and he said he would sell it. Um, and then about three days later, the broker gave him the paperwork and said, you know, okay, here's the paperwork, sign it. Middle of the night, my phone rings, and there's this guy going, I can't sell the boat! And it's, you know, it, it was one of those things where he operates in a different world. And in his world, you have to realize that, that this was the only thing he actually owned. For many years of his life, he didn't have a house. He lived on the road. He was a musician. His, the rest of his life was crazy. This boat was the place he came back to to sort of recuperate from all the rest of the craziness that was going on in his life. And for him to turn it loose was really hard. Um, I'm not sure whether he did background checks on Stacy and me, but it, it, he, he really wanted to know us. Now, the reason for this picture is the poor son of a bitch was just all into cocaine and heroin. And he tried to get on a plane in, I think it was Houston, and he had a loaded 357 Magnum and a big pile of cocaine in his carry-on. He just thought he'd just stroll right out of that airplane. That didn't work very well. The police obviously arrested him. He got out on bail, and he immediately rented a car in Texas, drove all the way to Florida where Mayan was, and got on the boat. 
thinking, of course, you know, where do you go when you have to run away? You go back to mine. Mine will take care of it. And his, one of his good buddies saw a car with a Texas license plate, obviously a rental car, on the boat and said, David, if you're trying to hide, turn the car around so the license plate doesn't show. Yeah. But, but at any rate, that same friend finally talked him into turning himself in. And the poor guy, this is him being arrested. The guy dried out um, cold turkey in a Texas jail in solitary confinement. And four hours ago, I was in Austin. And that's, a, that's not the rest of Texas. And I'll tell you, I wouldn't want to dry out in a Texas jail. But that's what happened. Um, so eventually, he got himself straightened out. In fact, I think the Texas jail fixed him. Since then, he hasn't been using. So at any rate, he came back, got my end pulled together, found Jan. That's that lady who's scratching his leg there. I'm not sure whether David has pants on in this picture or not, but it, nothing's showing, so we're OK. Um, and they used my end for exactly what this boat is just perfect for, which is just laying around sailing in the tropics, having terrific weather. And they went off to Hawaii. Here she is in Honolulu. So far as I can tell from David, she went to Hawaii at least three times. She went to Tahiti once, spent about a year in Tahiti. She also spent the rest of the time cruising out of Santa Barbara and cruising the, uh, the Channel Islands. So the, 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 the small sail you see coming off the front side of the, of the mainmast that's a fisherman's staysail, which is a fairly small one. Um, as we get into the rigging more, you'll find that there are staysails that go further and further down in that gap and are larger and larger. Now, one of the things about Mayan is um, I talked to her professional skipper, who David had employed for many years, and the guy who rebuilt the boat, Wayne Edel, and they were on this ride. This is the most heel that anyone in Mayan do. They, they actually were kind of shocked. They thought, you know, wow, 20 degrees of heel, that's like, this is, now, what you realize is the boat is so fat that once she gets heeled over about this much, she just sort of starts going down in the water. She doesn't heel over more as the wind increases. But there's David and Jan, his wife, off to Santa Cruz. Now, oh, they went to Southern California a bunch of times. That's, if any of you who have not been to Avalon in Southern California, this is a great, great town to stop off in. It's our American imitation of a French Riviera town. So we talked about this before. David sitting in the main saloon. Um, one of the things about the main saloon, and we'll come to this in a bit, actually, is that uh, basically when we got the boat, it had four queen-size double beds. And I asked David about the one that's right to, to your right, to his left. Because in the main saloon, there's this huge thing that's literally a queen-size bed. I said, so when you're going to Hawaii, don't you roll around a lot in the berth? And he winked and said, not if there are four or five people in there, <laughs> which was pretty much his approach. OK, so in tw in, by the time we get to 2005, the boat has begun to rot again. The work that was done back in 88 is, it, you know, it's, it's, it's expended its lifetime. And it's time to fix the boat. So David had the incredible good luck of running into actually a good friend of mine, Wayne Edel, who is a really good shipwright for this kind of boat. Wayne rebuilt the boat by first taking the rig out and then sticking her on a barge and then tying her up next to his tugboat. He has a 110-foot tugboat with all his heavy equipment in the back where the, the towing bits used to be and the winch used to be on the back of the tugboat. And he's got big planer, sanders, shapers, drills, everything. And so he set about rebuilding her. He replaced 70% of the frames, which you can see here. All the floors were, were done and all the iron was removed. Her original floor frames were iron floor frames, welded iron floor frames, and or excuse me, cast iron. And so those are now stainless, and the rest of the frames are all purple heart, because purple heart doesn't rot in fresh water. And it's mostly, it's almost the same strength and characteristics of white oak. It's not quite as good, but it, the, the no rot option is a big one. And then she's now double planked, and, and she's double planked in mahogany. Um, you can see here along the top edge, you can see the, 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 the stair step of the two planks. Um, I don't, unfortunately, have real details for those of you who are crazy about planking. We can talk about that later. But um, there's a kind of glue, it's an epoxy that's used to make golf club heads when people make laminated woods out of, for golf clubs. And this particular epoxy is, in, in my opinion, 
I, I'm really impressed with it. I think it's actually better for what Wayne used it for. So the entire, the double planking has a layer of epoxy between both planks, and inside and out of all planks and all frames are all painted with West. So she's basically still three inch by two and a half inch double sawn frames, and now two inches of double planking, in, a, you know, in addition to being completely soaked in West, which is just ridiculously overbuilt by any, any Santa Cruz standards. So this is Wayne. Um, He's, he's ferrying the hull. He actually does this with a plane, and it was, it was pretty startling. We had to do some repairs on the boat to watch him to actually just, just do a curve by hand with a plane. I, I've never seen anybody do that. Now, what's something you can't do right now, um, legally, is paint everything with red lead. Um, for those of you who are too young to know what that is, that orange stuff all over the paint, all over the boat, is, a, is an oil-based paint in which you mix lead right into the paint, which is really toxic. And then you paint it all over everything, and as a result, the boat doesn't rot. Inside and out of the boat has been red leaded. So there's that barn door rudder I was telling you about. She's, the bronze castings were all still the original, and those, as far as we can tell, those pieces of wood are still the original plank, pieces of wood from when she was built. This is one of my favorite bits of the, of the boat. Um, we're now going back to doing loops and hounds um, with Spectra and Dyneema. You know, we're now starting to use rope for rigging again. Well, when, when Mayan was built, this is steel. It's, it's, you know, it's wire and wire splices, which is wormed, parceled, and served with leather loops. But what's amazing to me is to climb up the rig on Mayan and look at the masts, which are the original rig, and the original hounds, and you know, and some of the some of the wire. I don't know how old it is, but it's it's really astoundingly durable. And so I think what's happened to us is we finally found another technology that lets us do this kind of rigging, um, which has some significant advantages. Because as you all know, because you can all splice Dyneema and stuff, you, you can you can build a shroud at a Dyneema in the middle of the ocean with no tools, and it beats the heck out of trying to get Navtech rod to work in the middle of the ocean. Okay, so she went back in the water after about three years out of the water. This is, this is all in Wilmington. Interestingly enough, Wayne's tugboat and this crane and everything are tied up on the exact spot where the Wilmington boat works used to be. So those of you who are really ancient like me will remember that there are a bunch of beautiful boats that were built by Wilbo and, and, and by Fellows and Stewart right across the channel. Once the hull was fixed, then it was time to start on the other rotten part, which is the deck. So all the decking was removed. When the boat was, was redecked in 88 in Florida, they put on three inch teak decking. That three inch teak decking had worn down to about two and three quarter inches, which is still way more than the original design. So it, it was all preserved. You can see the guys actually pulling the decking off here and working their way through. Every plank, every deck plank was numbered and they, 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 they re, 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 reused them all. So Purple Heart went in as the deck frames. You can see the, the, the red lead on the inside of the hull. And, and I realize this is a little bit of a crash course in the technology of wooden boat, boat building, but um, this is the way that, that, you know, people used to build like a full rig ship, you know, 200 foot ship in three or four months. And they used to build a yacht like this in about a month. They had a lot of guys who all knew what to do and they just banged it out because they'd done dozens of them. So here's all the new deck planks. You can see what she looks like without her painting <coughs> on her. Oh, one of the interesting observations Wayne made, which I found fascinating, is he said one of the problems with most boat restorations is the first thing that the restorer does is take the interior out of the boat. He said it takes about twice as long to build the interior as it does to build the hull. So it's a lot better if you don't have to take the interior out of the boat to just leave it where it is and you know, do the edges, you know, just do the parts that rot. And here's an interesting technique, which as far as I know is Wayne's invention. You can see the purple heart beam running underneath the deck planks. You can see the planks, which are two inch by two inch square here. Actually, they're about two and a half by two and a half. And then what you see here is, this is the, this is the black caulking that you see in a teak deck when you're walking around on one. 
Right here, he's, he's milled a half round, which is about an eighth of an inch in, in diameter, half of it into each teak plank. You can see it there quite clearly. And then he, when he puts each plank in, he fills that with white 5200 and then edge screws the, the planks together and fastens them down onto the deck frame. 5200 expands about 10% when it goes off. And as a result, it, it, because the planks are screwed together, the 5200 can't go anywhere except into the grain of the wood, and it builds this incredibly strong seal. And, you know, knock wood, the Mayans' decks don't leak. And it's, <laughs> and, it's been, and it's been about, let's see, it's been about 12 years since she was replanted, since the decks were done. Um, and then, of course, you still have to deal with scraping all the junk off the top. But he's, Wayne's now done this to five different boats, and none of them leak. And because the planks are now screwed both horizontally and vertically into the deck frames, the deck suddenly becomes a very strong member of the design of the boat. And what you'll find in a lot of old designs are diagonal straps of either iron or bronze that were to keep the, the frames and the planking from racking. Because and, and Hershoff built some very old, it's really interesting, I think that maybe America's Cup boats built, we probably know more than I. But he, he put diagonal strapping on the insides of the hull as well. Because when you build a square format with you know planks running this way, this way, it wants to parallelogram under stress. And the pull of the rigging, the shrouds and the, the load of the keel, and the fact that the boat is pitching, that all wants to make those things rack and as they start to leak. And so what happens here is by screwing in both directions, and, and I don't know if any of you ever tried to get 5200 off of something, but that's really sticky. So it makes the deck a real structural member of the boat. So here's the deck on the boat again, and a new covering board with new teak. Covering board is the one running along the edge where you can see the, the, the frames coming up to hold up the bulwark. Oh, so this is another one of my favorite things. Wayne's dad was a um, Navy welder. He was a chief petty officer, and his job was to weld stuff. So he built these, this bench for the engine. So there's an engine bench all out of stainless, and later on, you can see the tailstock of the transmission of the engine. The engine in this picture is sitting right in the middle of the main saloon, but you can see where it goes back up at the top of the picture. Um, now, that, 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 that horn timber right underneath all that, that's the original 1947 horn timber. There's nothing wrong with it. It's rock solid. So here she is sailing again, finally. Um, she's uh, obviously Marconi on the main. Pete Sutter, who many of you know, um, built these sails. As far as I can tell, these sails were at least 30 years old and maybe more. Uh, hey, Bo, what's how that? Long, Bo, how long did that take? About four years. And, and the reason it, it would have taken longer than that, but David ran out of money. Um, and so what happened, he basically, um, he spent a boatload on the hull and the deck, and he, he didn't have enough money to do the interior of the boat, which is what's underway now. Oh, I'm not sure I gave you guys the dimensions of the boat. It's 60 feet on deck. I, I, maybe I did. 16 feet wide, four and a half feet deep. It weighs... 48,000 pounds. Yeah, that's right. So there's David handing the boat off to me. Um, it's very fun to go eat tacos with David. About all the old people with hair my color, they all walk by and go, wow, that's David Crosby. And nobody else knows who the heck he is. There's our first sail. Um, I learned something about schooners with a lot, where you can put a lot of sail area up high. Um, we're actually going about three or four knots in this thing, and there's not one ripple on the water. But the, the, the biggest fisherman we had on the boat was way up at the top of the, between the fore and the main mast, and the boat was sailing along just fine. Um, it was kind of a strange afternoon. This is Matthew driving the boat down to Los Angeles. Um, we, a bunch of us rounded up, and we, we delivered the boat from Santa Barbara down to LA, where, where Wayne's boatyard is. Now, before we uh, tore her all apart, we decided there was this thing, that they're, in fact, they're having it in San Diego at the end of this month. It's, it's their Great America schooner race. And so we uh, rallied a bunch of guys, and we put together a crew, and we went off to race this thing. 
So, you know, it's a schooner race, so you, you have a beam reach start. You don't have people go upwind in schooners, so you can avoid it. So, so there's a beam reach start right off of the Silver Lake, uh, Silvergate Yacht Club off Shelter Island. Well, at the same time, somebody had decided to run a, a collegiate FJ regatta, which was, of course, running when we're lured, but they were about 150 yards on the non-course side of the starting line as these there were 22 of these schooners going back and forth through these kids. I finally gave up on worrying about them. I just assumed they would get out of the way, and, and they did. Um, in our first race here, that's us in the middle. The boat I talked about before, Rosa Sharon, is, is a, a Starling Burgess design. She's a, a Niga Et, if, for those of you who are schooner aficionados. Uh, Burgess designed a legendary schooner named Nina, which sadly we lost a couple of years ago in the Tasman. She sunk and was lost with all hands, and nobody, nobody knows what happened to her. But, which is, uh, I think, six feet longer than Rosa Sharon. Um, just, just scalded the transatlantic, and I think about 1926, with a little stasel schooner that could go up when, when none of the big honking. Um, then there's us, and then there's another Alden schooner, which is not a center border, named Scoopum. Uh, no, that's Curlew, sorry. And she's about, about five feet longer than us. Um, there we're leading. Oh, and this, the, I have to tell you the story. You just have to suffer through it. Up there off our hip is Dennis Connors in his schooner Fame, um, which he has re-rigged. The foremast is a, a Etchell's mast. The mainmast is a J105 mast. And his staysails are all on roller furlers, and he's got all kinds of tricked out stuff. But sailing with a bunch of these other schooners, and so given that he's one of the smaller boats and he's a damn good sailor, he was he, he was sort of hanging out at the starting line on right next to the committee boat, and it's a beam reach to start. So he would just figure, you know, when the gun goes off, I'll pull the sails and leave. We had the enormous pleasure of getting the bowsprit right under Dennis and say, Dennis, you're going up. And we, just, we took him right up and off the top of the starting line. He had to come, he started last. In this picture, he's going by us because that boat actually, for example, Fane rates about, I think about 130, and Mayan rates 189. So Fane is a much faster boat, particularly in these circumstances. But that was our big claim to Fane for that race. Here we are coming back in. This is just more gratuitous. Oh, there's one thing here. You'll notice the the the, the uh, stasel, the, the the fisherman stasel has gotten bigger. This one comes down much further along the foremast, and we now have a new set of sails, which which Dave Hodges and Dave Ullman built for us, where where this fisherman stasel, and this is where a lot of the power of the boat comes in these rigs. Um, so this is the. The larger fisherman. The smaller one ended about here, and this one comes down to here. Our new one actually looks like a Genoa, and it comes all the way down and overlaps the shrouds and is a deck sweeper. So, and, and we have a Genoa that does the same sort of thing. And you take this staysail, this main staysail down, and you take the fore staysail down, and you just use three sails. Um, and the this this fisherman that comes all the way down here is called an advance staysail. And the reason it's called that is Starling Burgess invented yet another boat that shook everybody up called the Advance. And the schooner Advance showed up with one of these staysails and could actually go upwind with it. Previous to Starling in doing, in inventing the Advance staysail, people thought that any of the larger sails you put between the two masts were really downwind sails like golly wobblers. With golly wobblers are act more like spinnakers. Um, so we have yet, I was out there with Hodges, <laughs> We were out in about 18, 19 knots of wind. We put the advanced staysail up. We sheeted it in. The boat just about fell over. And Dave went, I think, let's take it down. Let's take it down. Was, there was a lot of sail area. Um, OK, so this boat's really technology driven. That's the autopilot. That's the ring. Um, basically, uh, she will sail herself just fine. Um, this is me single handing the boat back from San Diego. We will have a real autopilot, but, but the string works. So after 28 years to 30 years, Hodges and Ullman built us a set of really nice looking sails, which I, I don't have any the boat yet, but uh, we're looking forward to sailing with these. And we developed Stacy, found the logo for our uh, golly wobbler. So when you see this really ugly 
come after you, or as you sail past us. That's that's mine. Um, so that you guys know Dave's loft, right? Yeah. <laughs> so so you guys know how big the loft is. Well, that's you're only looking at about a third of the golly wobble. And so the golly wobbler is almost 2.2 times as big as the mainsail on the boat. And so it goes from the top of the mainmast to the top of the foremast down to the bottom of the foremast and then sheets to the end of the main boom. Um, and it's, yeah. What's the weight of the sail pop? That's 1.7 ounce, one and three quarter. And how much does the sail itself weigh? That, that one's not too bad. You know, it's, it's like a, it's about like a Santa Cruz 50 spinnaker. Be a little bit heavier. Um, so off to the boatyard again. So this is, this is the boatyard. You guys don't need to see pictures of the boatyard. Okay, so in 1975, David put in these four big double berths. We went over that. Um, what we're doing to the boat is, is to, in the upper left, upper right there, we're putting in a, Passageway birth, we're putting in it. Oh, <laughs> Dave, <laughs> David put on a little weight, and so he didn't fit in the head. And so, as he put it, he said he, he became used to himself being shaped like an avocado. <laughs> and so, the, when we bought the boat, there in the middle of the passageway in the upper right there, there was just a head sitting in the middle of the passageway because that was the only place the owner could use it. So, we're, we're building a real head and getting rid of the, the queen size berths. Um, there's a picture of the way the head will be designed. Uh, well, that's what I thought it was going to be. It didn't turn out that way. So there's my new crew. <laughs> so one of the problems with the work we were we were planning on doing, yeah. The, the, the gears on the new crew, is that legal sail area? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. We don't know yet. We have, we have to talk to the PHRF committee about, <laughs> about that. <laughs> So one of the one of the issues with with trying to restore an old wooden boat is where do you get the wood? Um, it turns out there is very little genuine mahogany left. There's no forest anymore. There's very little anywhere. So after many months of and searching around and talking to wood dealers and everything, we finally found that part of Peru that goes up and over the mountains and ends up in the rainforest on the what you would normally think of as the Brazil side. And they still have mahogany there that they can legally harvest. So this this pickup truck full of, that's about half of the mahogany we put into the boat, but this pickup truck full of wood took at least 20 pounds of paperwork to buy this wood legally. Um, it turns out, I mean, and I completely understand why there should be these restrictions on this, um, but it, it, it is a challenge to find good mahogany. Um, when the boat, when we got the boat, we we knew from the photographs that the cabin sides were originally bright; they were varnished. But David had always painted them because he had the boat in the tropics. Well, my lovely bride decided that we needed to have varnished cabin sides. So when we stripped all the <laughs> when we stripped all the the paint, imagine the boat didn't. The wood didn't quite look perfect. It's 68 years old. So it had a few things that needed to be fixed. And so we, not we, the guys in the yard built these beautiful Dutchmen that go in. You can see there's a little bit of an inlet there because um, there are a couple of joints where things have been cracked and repaired. Um, you can see a new piece of mahogany going in. Um, this is that golf club epoxy I was telling you about, which is really amazing stuff. I, I'm, I'm, I'm real impressed with this, this epoxy. And then uh, this is my invention. You just basically build wooden wedges and you wedge the thing up against the bulwark and pound the wedges in and you don't need clamps. There wasn't any good way to clamp this. So the piece of wood on the left is from 1947 and the piece of wood on the right is from 2014. And it, it took Wayne almost two hours to find the grain he wanted for that particular piece of wood. Um, but it, it's coming together really nicely. So this guy, is unbelievable. Um, Jose is, uh, he's become a good friend. He's done lots of paint and varnish work on the boat. Um, I'm thrilled to say he, they discovered he had a brain tumor the size of my fist and they took it out about uh, three months ago. 
Now he's back on the job. He's got a great like punk rocker scar across his top of his head where they took his tumor out, but he's doing great. And um, the man is just, he is magical with the brush. So this was my job. We took out the whole interior of the four peak. So the inside of the boat, inside the frames, here is what's called the ceiling, which are the planks that run along the inside of the frames. This is all something called long leaf yellow pine. Um, I, I think it's one of the most amazing kinds of wood I've ever run into. It has such an incredible sap content that it, it's just after 80 years, it's still just dripping sap when you cut into it. So we left it there, stripped it, and varnished it. Um, what's that? <laughs> so, okay, so... Um, so we also this. I was, by the way, in charge of destruction. I was in charge of part. The other guys built stuff. I just tore things apart. Um, this is where the head used to be. You can see the the head through hole. But you can see the frames here. Um, you'll notice that between the double sawn frames, you can see that golf club, club glue coming out of there. They're all glued together as well. So this is going to be where the head goes along the passageway. Um, and this is in the main saloon. Obviously, I destroyed a lot of stuff. I basically tore most of the interior out of the boat. Um, this is parts going back in. This is a berth that goes in that area where the head used to be. Um, there's, in the upper right corner, you see that little square opening? Um, I learned in the tropics when I was in the early 90s that if you get anything like a quarter berth in, in hot weather, it becomes stiflingly hot in the berth. And so I had them put a hatch in that goes from this berth into the forecastle. And the other reason I wanted to do this is we got a lot of little kids that are going to go sailing on this boat. And I can't think of much that's going to be more fun than crawling out of that hatch, up into this berth, down here, running around the hatch, going back around here, round and around. The kids will really enjoy it. Um, this doesn't really show much of what, basically, we're building raised panel paneling for the boat. I'll keep this moving. And that stuff comes out like this. Wayne has an interesting technique. He, he varnishes the panels before he assembles the, the styles and rails. The rails are the vertical pieces, the styles are the little pieces, and the panels are the bits in the middle. And he does this a lot. He'll build things, take them all apart, have Jose finish them, and then put them back together again. And it's, it, over the time, it really, it really works. These panels float inside of the, the rails and styles. And he floats them with small rubber balls that are inside of the grooves where the panel goes. So the panel is not actually glued down. So as the wood expands and contracts, as the humidity changes or the temperature changes, things don't crack. Um, oh, the boat had one of those typical refrigeration systems with a... I'm really getting into the gory details. I hope you guys tolerate that. We had one of these, you know, like your compressors, belt driven off the generator and all that stuff. And I took one look at that and went, no, we're not, I'm not, I, I spent six years maintaining one of those. We're not doing that. So what we have is on the left, a 110 volt compressor to run a cold plate in the fridge. And on the right, a 12 volt compressor, which can make, it runs a little, one of those little ice maker tray things as loops. It turns out the little ice maker tray, if, it's, if that thing's running a 75% duty cycle, that little thing will actually hold it once it's cold. But when you go down to the market in Papa AT and you buy 30 warm food and you throw it in the fridge, you turn them both on so that they can actually pull the out. Um, we installed a hot water heater. The boat didn't have any hot water. David said, why do you need hot water? You're going to be in the tropics. You know? But we're not just going to be in the tropics. We're going to take this boat up north. So this is interesting boiler and I'm happy to talk to people ad nauseum about it, but it's diesel fired. It provides domestic hot water and also heating for the boat. And it's it's sort of like a giant S bar. Um, the, the big advantage of this one is it has a five gallon water reservoir in it that it keeps warm all the time. And that gives you a chance when you start drawing hot water out of it that, that you know there's a startup time for the diesel boiler. And typically that startup time is about two minutes or so between the glow plug and all the rest. And this lets it get going. So this is, I mean, the, the wood's starting to go back in. This is where the toilet's gonna sit in the head. And this is the whole reason we're doing this. And this is something I feel very strongly about. We got grandchildren now, and there is nothing better than growing up on a boat. 
And so that is basically where we are. If you were to arrive at Mayan today, you would see a giant empty boat with no bulkheads in it, no furniture in it, and the guys are installing the plumbing right now for the heater and the hot, domestic hot water and all the rest. And the interesting thing about the way the woodworking was done is that Wayne takes, he builds templates out of plywood, gets them all fit, then uses those templates to generate the mahogany pieces, and then put together with none of the wood finished, no, no varnish, no nothing on the wood, with shims in between the pieces of wood so that that can make up the difference for when there is going to be finish on the boat, so pieces of paper. And then he takes all, that, all those pieces of wood off the boat, and he, he's designed it so that you can basically take the whole interior apart with a screw gun, and he gives them to Jose, and Jose lays them out all over the tugboat and varnishes them all. And meanwhile, the guys are working on plumbing and all the stuff that, you know, the last thing you want in a boat when you're putting an electrical system in is any furniture. So they, they, they run all that stuff. I'm watching them now. What they're doing is they're now taking these beautifully varnished bulkheads and installing them inside the boat. So I think that's it. Yep. Um, okay. I've been talking a mile a minute. Any questions? Anybody? Yeah. Are you going to be finished in the next five years? <laughs> <laughs> so I was, I was down there uh, a week and a half ago, and basically all the parts of the interior are, are done. Um, we're, the, the real answer to your question is we hope to have the boat up here at the end of March. But you'll be available for the predicted logger. Yes. Oh, yeah. <laughs> we're going we're gonna to enter the predicted loggeries for sure. Yeah. So with the deck so rigid, yeah. And, and now basically a part of the entire hole. Do you have any fear of, of, of harmonics building up, basically, with such a rigid... On no, it's, it's still wood. It still bends. Okay. Um, you can still see, um, like, you know, when we were first tuning the rig, um, Wayne got a, a, a guy who knows how to tune these kinds of rigs, and I worked with him, and I couldn't believe it. I mean, I was wobbling the shrouds around. He says, no, no, that's, that's plenty tight enough. Uh, and you can... You can you can't feel the hull flex when the boat sails, um, but but you can see the measure with like with a laser thing. Or something. You can see things bend. It's it's not that rigid. It's it's um, one of the things is that uh, when when everything's it's kind of interesting. It it's an issue of dissimilar materials. So if all the, if the whole boat's made out of wood that kind of has similar flex characteristics, then it all kinds of bends and works together. The, the place that you see a noticeable difference is it has an iron ballast keel that runs along the bottom of the keel. And you'll see cracks develop because it's different than the rest of the boat. So when the boat bends, the iron doesn't. And it, it'll crack at the ends where the ends of the fitting are. And my uh -huh. sloop Sagapo that we just sold, it, it had the same the steel blade keel where it attached to the hull. You could see there, was, there were really tiny cracks. But the, the, the two materials didn't bend at kind of the same rate. That's probably a big mistake. I'm, I'm almost embarrassed to talk about something like that in front of Bill. <laughs> You're 100% right. <laughs> oh, good. good. Okay. Yeah. Not how many Bill's pumps is this thing? <laughs> <laughs> so, so today, if you find any water in the bilge, it's because you spilled it. There's there aren't any leaks. Um, the you we vacuum out the bilge with a with a shop vac. Um, but there's there's one 35 gallon per hour I guess 3500 gallon per hour bilge pump um, that's electric. There are two manual bilge pumps. One that's one of those old back breakers. You know you lift up like a gallon a stroke. And then there's one of the, one I dearly love. It has about a 12 or 14 inch diameter diaphragm and a six foot lever on it. And it's a whale gusher. I've never seen a whale gusher this big before. It has a five inch output pipe. And it, it's just, you stand on top of the, it's down below, you stand on top of one of the seats and work this five foot lever. And I don't know what that does, but we've never, we've never put enough water in the boat to actually use that one. Yeah? So, how big are you guys in general? Yeah, we have, the, let me go through the mechanics real quick. The main engine is a 130 horse uh, Mercedes bus engine, the bus diesel, that, that's from 1947 when the boat was built. And it um, is still running fine. The guys tore it apart in 2005 and mic'd everything and then just put it back together. It works perfect. It has a, a Yanmar um, 2GM20 
um, 16 horse as a, as a generator, and it has the typical mm -hmm. belt drive for alternating things like that on the, on the, the generator engine. And that drives, um, the main engine drives 150 amp, 140 amp alternator, and the, the generator has a, an 80 amp alternator and a 60. That drives into four 8D batteries that are 220 amp hours each. They're, they're flooded, they're normal old batteries. Um, eventually I'll upgrade that, but right now they're, they're only a year or two old, so please use them. Yeah? If this is not too personal, what are your plans for? <laughs> <laughs> so I, um, I thought that that when we, well, the the main plan for this boat is to go places. We're going to bring her here. We'll spend a couple of years, you know, kind of debugging her and making sure stuff works right. Go up to Tinsley, go down to Monterey, you know, things like that. But the the boat is meant to go. She she wants to go long distances. It takes so much work to get everything up and all trimmed. There's a lot of sails. I mean, it takes it takes a half an hour to get everything up and get yourself going. So you don't exactly want to say, "Okay, that was fun. Let's turn around." Um, so, so the idea would be probably do a test cruise to Mexico, um, Sea of Cortez kind of stuff. Uh, I just got an email from a good friend who's in Sea of Cortez, and I'm missing that. And then the places we would like to see are, I, I want to go back to the Marquesas, the Tuamotus, and the Society Islands. Uh, we want to go to Hawaii, but that's probably going to be the way we get up to the Pacific Northwest. And we'll, once we do all of those places, then we'll worry about going further. Not a, she's not what I would consider a high altitude, high latitude boat. Um, I would, I'd be cautious, you know, taking this boat up n north of, Alaska. I mean, north of Juneau, because you know she's she is only four and a half feet deep. She's really wide, and she wasn't meant for that. She's she's meant for much more modest sailing conditions. But the milk run through the South Pacific, she's she's perfect for that. She she'll do that just fine. The hurricanes, of course. Normal caveats. Did you put a fireplace in there? <laughs> <laughs> no, actually, we talked about it. We talked about putting in a fireplace, but but we decided. We, first of all, there wasn't an obvious place to put it. Schooners have a real bad characteristic from a design point of view. They have a main mast that goes right through <coughs> the main cabin. You know, you, you'll see her when we get her up here. Um, you know, and and this one's got a centerboard trunk that basically runs from the main mast all the way forward to the forest, almost. And so you have to work around that. But yeah, and then we also, the biggest issue was what do you do with the exhaust pipe? You know, you have this chimney sticking out of the top of the boat. So instead we installed this diesel furnace that you saw. But we couldn't find a good place for the exhaust pipe on that either. Um, so what we did was a hole in the side of the cabin and we're, run, we're running the exhaust pipe up and it's just gonna basically blow out a porthole. And um, when the weather's bad, you just close the porthole. Because people are always worried about putting loops in and all this stuff, and the, and the furnace guys get all upset about the back pressure if you put too many loops in. And of course, if you're a real good seaman, you want to put a loop in because you don't want water coming into the furnace. <coughs> just said, well, let's just put another porthole in. Just close the porthole when the weather's bad. So I got to remember to turn the furnace off when you close the porthole. <laughs> Other than that, <laughs> pretty good. <coughs> um, what else did I leave out? She's got a three-bladed feathering prop, a max prop which seems to work real well. Um, she backs up nicely. She backs to starboard, which always surprises me. I never expected to have a boat that backs to starboard. But yeah, what were you got? Yeah, uh, how, how fast is the motor of power? And, uh, well, at, how much, what's the fuel consumption? Yeah, so so at at seven knots, which is about 1,800 RPM, it's about two gallons an hour. And she'll go 10, but that's at like 2,100 RPM, and she's burning about four gallons an hour. So it's kind of depends on how you know what, what you want to burn. The engine doesn't care. It you know it's a bus motor. It's it, it's a funny story about this engine. The engine makes so much pollution that the Germans the Mercedes couldn't build it anymore. So sometime in the 60s or 70s they sold it. They sold the rights to it to the design to Tata in India and also to a company in South Africa. And they, but they still build them down there for buses because they don't worry about pollution. And so this thing, it it smells like a bus. You'll, you guys get downwind of us, you'll know you'll know we're there. What what's the standing rigging? Is it? It's it's all um, one by nineteen or seven by nineteen wire, um, and it's it's loop sliced. Um, and it does it does have turnbuckles. 
that was one of my criteria. No schooners with dead eyes. I mean, that's, that'd be okay if we could get away with Dyneema, but I didn't want rogue dead eyes in a schooner. <coughs> um, and she is obviously a staysail schooner right now. Um, we talked about putting her, when we were restoring her, we talked about putting her back to a gaff on the foremast. And our conversations decided that that wasn't a good idea. I've been swept almost off the deck a couple of times by a gaff during a during the you know, middle of the night trying to take the sail down. The gaff gets can get out of control. And actually, Taberly, we lost him because his gaff swept him right we lost him at night. Other comments? So we're gonna obviously have a big open house when uh, we get the boat up here. Welcome all of you down to the boat. We're, she's gonna have a slip right next to Bonacera on the other side of the harbor. She, we have the slip, we don't have the boat up here yet, but we got the slip, so we're all ready to do it. So you'll see her, and uh, you're obviously all welcome aboard. We do plan on racing the boat, so it's kind of no laughing and giggling when we show up at the starting line. And keep in mind, if you're anywhere near me, remember I can't turn. <laughs> so do not take a Santa Cruz 27 and say, come up right in front of me, because there'll just be little pieces of Santa Cruz 27 after you do that. Yeah, go ahead, Don. Yeah, I was going to say, ever embracing this schooner, it's like if you get a your parent, the thing just kind of stops. Yeah. So it, it reaches through life. But I think. 80 instead of 180 is probably more appropriate for the teacher. Yeah, well, that's. We're holding prop. <laughs> oh, yeah, 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 yeah. I got my, I got my certificate. I'm sticking with it. <laughs> so, if it's any, it'll be interesting to see because in the San Francisco Bay PHRF, they gave us 144. And, and the guys down here gave us 189 or 186. I can't remember what. But <laughs> well, we'll, we'll see. And, and when we raced in San Diego, we had, we had 189. And we ended up in the middle of the. Floor. We didn't have new sails then, but the it, it it is really funny to watch a boat tack through 105 degrees, and and you, if you pinch up, you just stop. You look good. All sails are full. You're looking good. You're just slightly, you know, slowly going sideways, <laughs> not going anywhere. The other problem is they don't go downwind very well, you know, because the mainsail blankets everything else. So you have to you have to basically sail the. The polars of a sport boat, but you can't plane, so it's uh, it's a, it's an interesting challenge. But that said, there are certain race courses around here, like the double angle race, which are just about perfect for a schooner, and maybe the Monterey and back. I think will be a real threat on the Monterey and back race. The, at least the Monterey two bit, but coming back will be a little more difficult. How long did it take you to tap? Uh, let's see. We one time we didn't make it. We, we came up into the wind, and the boat said, nope, not now. We're going back down. <laughs> so, so then I learned that I have to turn more aggressively the next time. Um, it's, it's at least three minutes, probably, to tack the boat. Um, if you have, that's without, if you have the, if you've got the advantage tacking the boat means take the advanced staysail down, which is like, you know, lowering a 2,000 square foot sail, the other kind of sail. Um, Shifting it over to the other side of the main staysail, tack the boat, you know, hoist the advanced staysail back up again, plus two sets of running back stays, all the rest. So there's plenty to do. If you want a crew, let me know. Because when we were racing in San Diego, we had 12, is that right? 12 people on board, and we were at least three or four short if we wanted to do things quickly. And we also made the mistake, I, <laughs> this was very embarrassing, but I polished the winches. And so the lines wouldn't get a grip on the witches, so everybody was cursing and swearing. And I refuse to admit who had polished the witches. Uh, anyway, um, where we had witches, this is yes, my lovely wife, Stacy, said, pointing out that um, there is no winch on the main sheet. So you basically grab a hold of it and pull. And of course, when you're cruising, that isn't a problem because you just head up wind until the main lost and pull it in as much as you want. But when you're going around the lure, and you have a skipper that gets kind of wound up. It's like, pull the main in. You don't we, have your wife on we, the main Yeah, you don't put the, <laughs> the, the, small, the five foot tall wife on the main team. Um, it is amusing. There's only a five, a six to one. So, and it's about, yeah, it's about eight, it's seven, it's 780 feet, square feet, which is way too much for six to one. Yeah. So, Bo, I know you like to single hand. Yeah. See, you're not single handing all the time. Yep. 
you have plans to do so on this phone? Actually, yes. Um, we're, we're installing an autopilot. I called up Stan and I asked what autopilot to buy, and I got the I took careful notes. So we have literally got the cosmic six axis gyro, you know, and he gave me the rate at which it has to turn the wheel. And actually, I com the first time we put the motor on the wheel and spun it, Wayne just went, oh my gosh, because I mean, you could kill somebody with the wheel with a spike sticking out. <laughs> so, so anyway, what Wayne came up with a great idea. He, he's, he's machining the shaft that the wheel is on, and there'll be a pin just below the, the wheel. You pull the pin out and slide it down. It slides off the key. You put the pin back in, and then the shaft can turn inside of the the wheel without turning the wheel, so we don't mutilate somebody with the wheel. But yes, so so one of the things I should tell you guys, I mean, I, I as a little as a young man, I, I sailed all over the place. So the the schooner we sailed was 80 feet on deck. It was 105 probably overall. It was gaff fore and main. It didn't have a standing backstay, and we sailed that with four people. And on two or three occasions, I sailed it with just me and one other guy. And the only the limiting factor there was you couldn't get the sails up because the gaff was so heavy and the sails were canvas. So we, with two guys, you could just barely get the mainsail up. So with this boat, the, the, we've got winches. You know, we've got re really nice variant um, real winches. And I'll tell you, one of the best uses of Dyneema, I've ever replaced the wire on a wire halyard winch with Dyneema. It's so nice. It just... It's everything smooth, no no meat hooks. It's just great. So the the reason that the schooners are rigged the way they are, which a lot of people have lost through the history of all this, is that when they were working boats, especially fishing schooners, the the Grand Bank schooners would go out with twenty or twenty five guys on the boat, and everybody except the cook and the ship's boy would get off the boat in a dory and go fishing. And then at the end of the day, the ship's boy and the cook would sail around and pick up all the dories. So what the rig was sailed with a really small number of crew on board. The way you do that is you never put up the mainsail. You just sail her around with just the foresail and, and the four staysail. And she'll sail, she'll sail all over the place with just the, the main on, on a staysail schooner rig with the staysail, main staysail and the four staysail. She's really easy to sail. And those sails are, are really small, the foot. Well, they're not really small. The 15 foot length on the foot, and the luff is about uh, 38 feet. So they're, you know, they're not, they're not very big, and they're self-tacking. They have booms on the bottom, so you know, they, they, you can tack the boat easily, and you don't go very fast. But if you know, you want to sail around by yourself, that's just fine. So you'll see me out there sailing by myself. And, and when I brought the boat back from San Diego, I had it was blowing 30, and I had, I did put the main up, but I had the main and the four stay solo. Up and the boat was, you know, it was going upwind at, at about 60 degrees apparent wind angle. <laughs> and, uh, but it was, you know, going eight knots up, you know, on tight reach. And it's, it's really not that much trouble. The mainsail is about the same size. How, but Bill, how big is the mainsail on a Santa Cruz fit? I, I don't have the numbers in my yeah. head it's about the same size. Yes, yeah. I think I, it feels like it's about the same size. The aspect. Aspect ratio is different because the ma the mast is lower and the boom's longer, but um, but no, it's, it's not it's not a hard rig to sail. You be you be amazed. The other thing is the boat doesn't move. Seeing how comfortable it is to sail a boat that doesn't move around underneath you, it just it makes life lots easier. But you don't want to do anything quickly, right? You take the sails down at mile buoy on your way in. You don't take them down in the channel coming in the harbor. Anything else, guys? Yeah. Well. Thank you very much for putting up with this. Uh,